sales pitch, I'll hold a sales talk. More specifically, I'd like to talk about how to approach sales in the early life cycle of a startup. So just uh, to my personal history, I have a background in enterprise SaaS sales, as I mentioned. Um, I used to be one of those people cold calling you with my script and my list of features, and I'd tell you about all the great features of the product. Um, and I began to understand, and I began to grow, and I began to learn, and I reached the point where I understood the process. And I wanted to improve upon the process. Um, but as you might also know, the larger an organization is, the more difficult it becomes to set change in motion. And I became frustrated. And life is short, and time is precious, and I want to do something I'm passionate about. So I left my job, and I joined a young team of entrepreneurs with a successful project behind them and an ambitious one ahead of them. So from my perspective, this is perfect, right? I have no existing process. I have no existing pricing structure. I have no existing script. I have a blank page. I can creatively solve problems as I see fit, right? What I wasn't expecting is, for the entrepreneurs among you, at this point, you have no product. Uh, you, you have no marketing materials. And most importantly, you have no budget for Salesforce and similar things. So I had these new problems, and I was looking for a way to tackle them. And I didn't have to reinvent the wheel here. As Holger mentioned, Lean Startup exists. So there's the man who started the movement, the man who coined the term, uh, the man who teaches us how to turn that theory into practice, uh, and all the unsung heroes. One I'd like to mention, so if this is new to you, um, Justin Wilcox runs a blog named Customer Dev Labs. And if you're new to customer development, um, he has some really good tips on how to get you started. So I joined this new team, and I had these new theories. And what I realized was that a lot of what I was learning was similar to what I had done in the past. Sales and customer development is not that different. Most importantly, the goal of sales and the goal of customer development is quite similar. It is differentiating between these people that are willing to appease you and say, please, tell me more about your product. Please, call me back in six months. And these people who are willing to reach in their pocket and give you a dollar for your idea. So I've been appropriating some of the lean. Um, probably shouldn't be doing this at a lean conference. I've been appropriating some of the lean into my sales process. So it's not completely lean. It's not completely sales. It's, it's me. Um, let me give you some context here. So because I'm going to be using examples from the project I'm currently working on. So um, we did a lot of research. And we were researching this rumor that exists that there is a high demand for technical talent in Berlin. So any developers here? Any, any problems finding work? <laughs> so so the, it's good for you, but not so good for the entrepreneurs who end up paying a lot, um, who, <laughs> who end up struggling to find a developer on time that can help them with their projects. Um, so we knew that this, that this demand existed. What we discovered at the same time was that there are an increasing number of companies, agencies, in Poland, Ukraine, and, and in the entire Central and Eastern Europe um, that are focused on startups, that are focused on Western Europe. So there's no solution to connect these two groups. And that makes no sense at all. So we decided to create Teich uh, to connect high quality design teams and development teams with startups. And we do this through an online directory. And we do this through offline events. So one of the first things we realized in this context is that if we were going to be successful, we need to have a low entrance barrier for startups. Startups don't have the budget, as I mentioned, so it needs to be free. And that left the agencies as our clients. So all of this is coming from a B2B perspective, and it's coming from the, from the perspective of selling a service, not a product. So if you're selling B2C, uh, if you're selling a product, I don't know if this applies to what you're doing one-to-one, -one, um, but this is kind of my journey. And uh, I'd like to share three things I learned along this journey with you. First of all, be a masochist. Um, why? OK, so what you're doing at this point is you're creating a solution. To create that solution, you need to first find a problem. You cannot base the problem statement on assumptions. Right? And, and there are a lot of points where you, you will be led to a point where you might want to base it on assumptions. When you're scheduling the third follow-up meeting, and they cancel on you, you might think, oh, they're not interested in my product. Maybe they just don't have time. So to get to the real answers, you need to be persistent. You need to keep digging. You need to keep calling. Right? And 
what you're doing is you're getting feedback. And I, and I know this is old. I know you, probably every presentation that has been at the Lean Startup Meetup has included the term feedback in one way or another. But I mention it because I consider it essential. And I mention it because it's daunting. It is people criticizing you and your idea a lot, all day. But it's the only way that you're going to prove your idea. It's the only way that you're going to get better. And you need to be in that mind state to absorb that feedback and turn that into something actionable. So my advice is listen closely, right? ask, ask for more, and say thank you. Because these people are giving you their time. They're giving you their attention. And, and they're helping you create value. So, so let me get um, into the gist of it. Um, how this helped us in, in a concrete example is, well, we had our customer discovery. And we assumed that there were all these great development and design agencies that were in need of more projects. Um, so that's what we offered them, more projects in Western Europe. But as it turns out, we persisted. We dug deeper. Um, that's not the case. They're already working at full capacity. What's more, many of them are working above capacity with backlogs that go, bu that go half a year. So, so apparently, what we were offering them was not solving their problem. If anything, it was creating additional problems. So we took back our offer, and we dug deeper. We persisted. And what we found out is that they were bored with a lot of the projects they were working on. What's worse, their, de their de developers were bored. Their developers would leave them and go to other companies with more engaging projects in search of something interesting to work on. They weren't looking for more projects in Western Europe. They were looking for special projects in Western Europe. They were looking for entrepreneurs that had big visions that they could get behind. So we changed our offer. Instead of offering them quality, a uh, quantity, sorry. <laughs> Instead of offering them quantity, we offered them quality. And the day we did that is the day we started selling. Now, for those of you familiar with Lean, is there any way, any better way, to validate your product, your problem solution fit, than someone to give you money and say, "I'm willing to pay for your service. I think you can help me." And that brings me to my second point. What do we do? We created value. Be valuable, right? So ever since I've been young, and I'm sure you've shared similar experiences, people have been shoving products in my face, products I don't want, products I don't need. This is bad sales. Don't be that person. right? You have tools. You have feedback. You can use that. And what's more, the ace in your hole is you're flexible at this point. right? Even if you have your MVP, to iterate that, it's not a daunting task. It's not going to cost you a lot. Use that feedback to create value. And don't create a USP, create a UVP. Create value. And how do you do that? Well, you answer the very simple question, are we solving a problem? For you, and you, and him, and her, and that dog over there. Um, so, and, and if you can do that, then you have your product market fit. You've, you've, you've verified that. So what happens to sales? Well, sales stops being you shoving products in people's faces, and it becomes a series of conversations. A series of conversations that aim to help your potential clients come to a conclusion. And this is his or her conclusion about whether or not what you're offering is of equal or greater value to what you're asking them to pay, to the price. So again, let me show you how this worked in, in, in the example of the project that I'm working on. Um, as I mentioned, we have the event, and we have the online directory. And we're selling this as a bundle. We're selling booths and six-month subscriptions. And this was working fine. Th this was selling, right, as I, as I mentioned before. Um, and more and more clients were saying, well, I don't have time to be at your conference. Um, you know, I I'd like to see how the first conference goes before I go to one of your conferences. I'd just like to be a member of the online directory for now. So of course, we're flexible. right? We're listening to the feedback, we adapted. We created online packages. And we used that same logic that was selling before. And we had a six-month subscription. No one was interested. No one, no one was buying this. Right? So what was the problem? We persisted. We dug deeper. And as it turns out, many people feel that a six-month subscription in advance without the event is too much of a risk. So we reduced the subscription to one month. And the week we did that, 
we had a record amount of sales in terms of volume. So there's our product market fit. Right. And that brings me to our last point, uh, to my last point. How is any of this possible? You need to be meticulous. You need to have that data. I collect data on everything. I, I want to know which roles exist within an organization. I want to know who's buying. I want to know how those roles are interrelated. I want to know what you had for dinner. And to my understanding, as far as I understand lean, this isn't really lean. In lean, it's about getting the right data, getting the right metric, right, and focusing on that. But I don't want to do that. I, I, I fear that I might have blind spots, that I'm, that I'm missing something essential to what we're doing. Right? I want to keep the big picture in mind. I want to be able to go into that data and find patterns that might not be evident, that might not, I might not even be thinking of at this point in time. Right? This requires hours of research. This requires hours of data entry every day. This is not a small task, and this is not something you want to be wasting your time on. So how do we solve this problem? Is, is anyone here willing to come to my office and uh, help me copy and paste emails into a CRM a few hours a day? Anyone? <laughs> Cookies. <laughs> um, well, I haven't found any volunteers yet. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm using Odesk. I found two virtual assistants, huge help. What they're doing is they're helping me create dossiers on all the companies I'm talking to. They're making sure that all that data is in the CRM, and the CRM is up to date. And even better, they're making sure my tasks are up to date. So I never miss a, I never miss a follow up. I never miss a meeting. So you could use an Excel sheet to do this. You could use any CRM to do this. Depends on your personal preference. We're using base, um, mainly because you can easily import data from LinkedIn with a, a little add-on they call the contact flipper. Uh, it has a great analytics feature, so it has a funnel. You can just look at that. It's really accessible. You, you see how you're converting at each stage in real time. And lastly, it automatically tracks my emails. So I'm not stuck copying and pasting emails into a CRM all day. Um, I have a weekly review. So once a week, I sit down, I look at the funnel, I find out where the bottlenecks are. And then I drill down. I have that data. I have all the emails there. I have the dossiers there. I don't need to base my assumptions on numbers. I can persist. I can create value through the feedback I've been collecting. And I can find those patterns. So that's what's been working for me. Um, I'm sure all of you have your own solution. I just, I'm, I'm happy I got to share that. And to bring it back to our original question, uh, how do you approach sales in the early life cycle of a startup? Well, for me, it's a tool. It's a tool to identify and create value. And you better be a meticulous masochist if you want to do it well. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Questions? I run to you with microphone. My hand so that I can see you. Ah. Great speech, Derek. Thank you. Um, I had a question uh, and a follow-up question right away. Are you a sales guy in the in the startup, or are you more all-rounder? And if you are a sales guy, what does the product manager do? Um, so I, I'm in a startup. Uh, in startups, you don't call it sales; you call it business development because that sounds really edgy. Um, so yeah, I, I do business development in the startup. Um, and what the product manager does is we have a very close feedback loop. So I'm out there basically doing customer development while he's making sure that we're on deadlines and, and that our product is, is a good fit. And he also takes care of key account management. Okay. And about the data collection, you collect the data, does the product manager ask his own sources of KPIs or it's like your responsibility? It's my responsibility, it's my feedback ultimately. Um, but he does have access to the CRM, so if he wants to validate anything, if he wants to verify the information I'm giving him, he can do that. Okay, more questions? Show your hands so that I can see you. Anything you want to share about sales? <laughs> no? Okay. All right, then, thanks again, Dirk. Thank you.